I'm Mark Corbett. Uh, I live on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, and it's been my goal to dive and document every diveable shipwreck on the Outer Banks. Um, I've been doing this since 1992 and seriously pursuing my goal for the last 13 years. I'm presently working on a series of books about the North Carolina shipwrecks. In diving these shipwrecks, I've visited and even identified a number of vessels that served in the Civil War. Um, I'm not going to go into an immense amount of detail on, the, on any single one of these because we don't have time for that. But I, I'd like to sh shed some light on what happened here during the Civil War and the vessels that are out there. Um, the Outer Banks is a rugged, windswept coastline where three bodies of water meet. Uh, long considered one of the main obstacles to navigation on the United States East Coast, the Outer Banks was also a battleground during the Civil War. Uh, numerous ships were lost on the Outer Banks during the Civil War, and numerous vessels which had served during the Civil War later came to grief on this coast, uh, often called the Graveyard of the Atlantic. Some of these shipwrecks are buried by the sands. Some of them are uncovered and can be dived on. Others have yet to be discovered. Uh, fought between 1861 and 1865, the Civil War is without a doubt one of the most pivotal episodes in the history of the United States. No matter what your take on the subject, there's no question that the history of the United States and the world history was shaped by this conflict. Uh, most of the time when people think of the Civil War, the great land campaigns come to mind, such as Antietam, Shiloh, Gettysburg, Malvern Hill, and the Siege of Petersburg. But to truly understand the war between the states, you've got to examine the war at sea. Uh, the war at sea is often overlooked, but I'll go as far as to say the Confederacy really lost the Civil War at sea. Stories of barefoot, undersupplied Confederate troops begin with the fact that the South lost control of most of its waterways uh, and by 1862, and, and they never had control of their territorial waters out in front of their states at all. Uh, the South didn't have much industry and relied heavily on imported goods, mostly from England, and to supply its troops and citizens. From the outset of the conflict, the U.S. Navy imposed a blockade on the Confederate states. No material was allowed in or out of the South. Uh, one of the greatest historical undertakings of the U.S. government was the preservation of Civil War military, army, and naval records into encyc this encyclopedia-sized set of books called the Official Records of the Union and Confederate Navies. Uh, if something happened during the Civil War on the water, it's most likely in this series of books, and, and it really is the size of encyclopedia. But the good thing about it is it is now available online, which means you can keyword search all the, the Civil War records. And if you're trying to find something out, you can probably locate it in there. Uh, so to really understand the role the Outer Banks played in the Civil War, you've got to cross the border into Virginia and enter the Chesapeake Bay. You can see the location of Fortress Monroe here. I, I've circled it. Um, this was at Old Point Comfort in Hampton, Virginia, and it's where the Chesapeake Bay and the James River meet. While Fort Monroe was never, while Fort was, Monroe was in the state of Virginia, unlike Fort Sumter in South Carolina, it never fell into Confederate hands. As you see, this point controls access to the James River, the Chesapeake Bay, and most importantly, has open access to the Atlantic Ocean. So from a perspective of where it was located and by the fort's very nature and because the United States military kept it well manned, 
it would have been extremely difficult for the Confederates to have taken Fortress Monroe. So the fort became a major base of operations for the U.S. Navy. Uh, what this came to mean is that the Confederates never were able to control access to the ocean from the James River. And after early 1862, the Confederates never had control over the James River. This allowed the Union Army to land troops pretty much anywhere on the James uh, between Old Point Comfort and Drury's Bluff, which is a uh, Confederate gun battery located on a riverside cliff seven miles south of Richmond, Virginia. So as you can see, the Union Navy had almost free reign over the waterways in Virginia since the start of the conflict. It controlled access to the ocean, and while Richmond may have been the capital of the Confederacy, its direct access to the Atlantic was blocked. Supplies, from, ha, supplies had to come into Richmond by rail from points further south. Uh, what that means is that Hampton Roads, Virginia became the place from which the Union Navy was able to launch many of its operations. Among the first operations to uh, commence along the Outer Banks were the Union attacks on Fort Clark and Fort Hatteras right down here, uh, followed by General Burnside's expedition. During late August 1861, the 9th and 20th New York Infantry, under command of General Benjamin Butler, captured Fort Hatteras and Fort Clark near Hatteras Inlet. A series of skirmishes up and down Hatteras Island, sometimes referred to as the Chip Chickamacomico races, resulted in what was basically a stalemate, with the Union forces occupying Fort Hatteras and Fort Clark, which are literally right out there in the water is where Fort Hatteras and Fort Clark were. Uh, and the Confederates withdrew up to Roanoke Island. Uh, an army was raised near Annapolis, Maryland under command of General Ambrose Burnside. This was an amphibious force utilizing mostly hired and requisitioned vessels. There were, as many, there were at least 80 of them. Uh, basically anything they could get their hands on ship-wise, they used. Uh, the Motley fleet left Annapolis on January 9th and assembled at Port Fort Monroe at Old Point Comfort, Virginia. The fleet departed for Hatteras on January 11th. The goal was to establish Union control of the North Carolina Sounds. These vessels would operate in conjunction with U.S. Navy vessels under command of uh, Flag Officer Lewis Goldsboro. Uh, there were a number of vessels wrecked during the Burnside Expedition. Uh, one of the first vessels to wreck during the Civil War on the Outer Banks was actually not a Union or Confederate vessel. The French war steamer Prony, which I think is in the middle here, uh, wrecked on the Ocracoke Inlet Bar in November of 1861. The crew of the French vessel was rescued by the Confederates and then later turned over to the Union under a flag of truce. Uh, a small Confederate privateer called the Warren Winslow struck a sunken lightboat and sank while trying to assist the Prony. The crew of the Prony were turned over to the Union fleet. Uh, the medium-sized screw steamer City of New York had been used for a decade before the Civil War as a, con as a coastal steamer. Uh, it plied the route between Boston and New York, and it often went to Hopewell, Virginia. The vessel was chartered by the U.S. Army and attached to General Burnside's Coastal Division. The vessel ran aground and capsized on January 15, 1862, while trying to cross the bar at Hatteras Inlet. City in New York was carrying ordnance. Uh, she drew about 15 feet of water, and at the time, Hatteras Inlet was 13 feet deep, so you can kind of see the problem. When she ran aground, she kind of went on her side and broke up there and was, was just washed over by the uh, frequent swells here, and she didn't last long. She is probably still there. Uh, also lost in Hatteras Inlet was a small steamer, Zouave, which overran her anchor during a storm and knocked a hole in the bottom of the ship. Uh, her guns were saved 
and one schooner loaded with coal was also lost, and this was while they were waiting to try to get over the bar at Hatteras Inlet with the fleet from Burnside's expedition. Uh, the Zouave was transporting 25th Massachusetts volunteers and their supplies. The troops were removed before the vessel went down. The Zouave was formerly a Hudson River freighter known as the Marshall Nye. She was bought by the U.S. government and converted into a gunboat. And this is a small lithograph picture of her. Uh, so where do these wrecks lie? My suggestion is that the inlet today is further to the southwest of where it was during the Civil War. So that puts these wrecks somewhere right out there. Um, probably maybe a little bit towards the southwest from where we're sitting right now. Uh, the area is notorious for shifting sands and I feel fairly safe in saying that the wrecks are covered with sand. I've heard stories, but I have never been able to locate either of these wrecks. Uh, gave myself a real bad sunburn one day running a side scan sonar back and forth in this area. But if they, uh, they definitely should still exist, but they're probably covered up with sand. Um, so the next wreck we're going to talk about is the Pocahontas. Two days after the city of New York was wrecked, the steamer Pocahontas ran aground carrying horses somewhere most likely near Avon, North Carolina. The Pocahontas holds the distinction of being the earliest built of any steamship to wreck in North Carolina. She was built in 1828, so this is ancient steamship technology. You want to get much further back than that, you're talking about the first steamships. Uh, she was built at Beecham and Gardner in Baltimore and was a Chesapeake Bay steamer. Pocahontas worked on the Old Bay steamship line for decades, transporting passengers and goods between Baltimore, Norfolk, and sometimes Richmond, Virginia. This is a, 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 a picture done by the Mar Maryland, cons the Maryland underwater archaeology, and this is Columbus, which was the sister ship of the Pocahontas. They actually found the Columbus's machinery in the Chesapeake Bay because she wrecked during 1858. So if they ever find, if Pocahontas is ever found, they actually have something to compare it to because the underwater archaeology unit in Maryland has the steamship engine from the Columbus. Uh, Pocahontas was said to have started falling apart before the journey ever began. As I said before, the Burnside expedition used whatever vessels they could get a hold of. They probably should have passed on Pocahontas. Uh, plagued with mechanical problems and sinking, the vessel was run aground by the pilot to save the lives of the men and horses on board. There was no loss of human life, but sadly, many of the horses died. The New York Times reported that the vessel was lost at Little Kennekeet Shoals, 12 miles north of Hatteras Light. So that would put it roughly in the same area as where the Little Kennekeet Life Saving Station, which is just north of Avon, is today. Um, the Confederate steamer Curlew lies in shallow water near the Old Man's Harbor Bridge in the Croatan Sound. The Confederates operated a small group of converted river vessels, often referred to as the Mosquito Fleet, on the Albemarle Sound and Roanoke and Pamlico Sounds during the Civil War. The Curlew, before the war, had been a small sidewheel steamer operated between Edenton, Elizabeth City, and Nags Head, North Carolina. The vessel was acquired by the Confederate Navy in 1861. The Mosquito Fleet was used to harass Union shipping, and they did a pretty good job of it early in the Civil War. They actually did such a good job of it that the Union Navy was convinced they were facing something like 20 Confederate vessels that were coming down and, and lobbing shells at Fort Clark and Fort Hatteras. Uh, there were only six of them. Um, the Confederates during the early part of the Civil War were really good at convincing the Union Navy and the Union Army that they were facing more 
in numbers of troops and vessels than they actually were. Another place that they did this was outside of Yorktown, Virginia, during the early part of the Peninsula Campaign. What the Confederates did was march troops in front of the Union lines day and night to convince them that they were facing higher numbers than they actually were. So the Union kept digging in there while the Confederates had a chance to bring in more troops from down south. This was one of their, their, their early tactics. Uh, the Curlew became somewhat infamous when she captured the Union steamer Fanny off of Chickamacomico at the start of October of 1861. On February 7th, 1862, Burnside's forces advanced up the Pamlico and landed troops on Roanoke Island. During combat with a much larger Union fleet, the Curlew was hit and run aground to keep from sinking. Uh, this is near Redstone Point in Man's Harbor, which is actually where the old Man's Harbor Bridge connects to the, the mainland off of the northern part of Roanoke Island. Uh, the Curlew actually ran aground in front of a beach dirt-filled barge with guns, which they called Fort Forest. Uh, this wasn't good for the Confederates because it blocked the fire from Fort Forest, and the Confederates torched both the Curlew and Fort Forest to keep them out of enemy hands. A number of small vessels were intentionally sunk by the Confederates, along with pilings to create an obstruction in the northern part of the Croatan Sound. I was told by people from ECU Maritime history that the remains of the curlew and the remains of this blockade fleet that they had sunk have been located. Uh, the remains of the curlew are near the Man's Harbor Bridge. I've dived them from a kayak. The depth of the water is probably about seven or eight feet. The rusted remains of the small steamer stick up out of the sand here and there. On most, good, on most days, three feet's good visibility in the sound. Uh, I've also located to the inshore of the Curlew what may be the remains of a cannon from Fort Forest. The small part that was sticking up out of the silt had the look of twisted iron of a cannon that had been spiked and blown up on purpose where they capped the end of the gun and set a charge off inside it and blow the gun up. Uh, after the capture of Roanoke Island, Birdside and Goldsboro steamed down the Pamlico Sound and captured New Bern, North Carolina in March of 1862. Uh, Fort Macon, which guarded Beaufort and Moorhead City from the ocean side, fell into Union hands. The U.S. Navy quickly established bases in these areas and closed most of the northern coast of North Carolina to Confederate shipping. What remained open at that point in North Carolina were the approaches to Wilmington, North Carolina, which became the biggest port for blockade runners during the Civil War. Uh, the steamer Oriental was only 10 months old when it ran aground in May of 1862, carrying U.S. Army troops and munitions. Uh, they were headed to Port Royal, South Carolina, which is another place that the Union had captured on the East Coast. Uh, the Oriental is called the Boiler Wreck and is a familiar sight to boats entering from Oregon Inlet and even cars on the highway as the wreck which sticks out of the water is easily visible. It's located on Pea Island just across from the Pea Island Visitor Center. The part that sticks out of the water is not in fact a boiler but a steam cylinder of a large inverted steam engine. The wreck's pretty far off the beach so I recommend you use a kayaker maybe a boat if you're heading out that way. Uh, the top of the Oriental steam cylinder as it appears today, this is what it looked like in the 1980s. You can tell that it's slowly sinking into the sand. Uh, my friend Lou Ostendorf gave me this picture. And what is visible today is about half of what was visible in the 80s. I remember surfing there in the 80s when it looked about like that. Uh, 
When you descend from the top of the steam cylinder onto the Oriental, one of the first things you'll see is this large lever that drove auxiliary machinery here. And you can swim into between the four legs of the steam cylinder. Uh, on the opposite side of the steam engine are the boiler and condenser pipes, which steam went to into and out of the engine. Uh, this is the top of a large flywheel that's attached to the prop shaft. It exits the engine and had this flywheel attached because it was only a single cylinder engine and it would have been jerky if it didn't have something to keep the force constantly rotating. So this flywheel's huge. It's probably 10 feet tall. Uh, at the opposite end of the ship is the bow. It's separated from the steam cylinder by about 100 feet of sand. Uh, this is the top of the capstan winch. And this is the edge of the bow where it is broken off. And I believe it lies on its starboard side. OK, so if you imagine the coast from Fortress, so if you follow the coast from Fortress Monroe out the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia, and start heading down south towards the Outer Banks. Uh, just a bit past the state line, we find the wreck of the R.B. Forbes, which happened only a few weeks after Burnside took Roanoke Island. The Forbes was a small iron steamer built in 1845. She was commissioned in August of 1861 and was involved in a number of misadventures early in the conflict. Uh, one of which was her captain fired into a Union flagged vessel because they felt that it disrespected him and he was known as a notorious drunk. Uh, that captain Gregory was dismissed after this incident. The Forbes was in involved in the capture of Fort Walker and Beauregard in Port Royal, South Carolina. On February 25th, 1862, the Army Forbes ran aground in a gale at a spot four miles south of Currituck Inlet. And this is the spot. You can clearly see the shape of a ship in the water. I've zoomed in on it here. And this image came off of Google Earth. Uh, is this the wreck of the Army Forbes? Using the measuring tools on Google Earth, I have measured it out, and the size of the wreck is consistent with the size of the R.B. Forbes. The location is almost dead on. Uh, it was given from where the old, the newer Currituck Inlet was, and it's almost in the exact location. Uh, there's a wreck marker on this spot on the charts of the area. Unfortunately, every time I've dived it, the water was only about eight feet deep, which indicates that the site is sanded in and nothing was ever sticking out of the sand. This satellite picture was taken in 2008 and the wreck lies in a deep spot behind the sandbar that must have been uncovered then. Uh, perhaps one day it'll be uncovered and can be properly investigated. After the Forbes ran aground, it was torched by its own crew to avoid capture. Uh, in this picture, you see Lieutenant Fly, who was at the time the, ca the captain of the R.B. Forbes. And this is the next vessel that he was assigned to, which is the next one we're going to talk about, the USS Monitor. Off Hatteras lies one of the most famous shipwrecks in the world. The USS Monitor was, John, it was designed by John Erickson and built for the U.S. Navy by Continental Iron Works at Greenpoint, Long Island. The vessel was the first of many ironclad monitors built for the US Navy. Her engines were built by Delameter Iron Works in New York, and she featured a rotating gun turret with two 12-inch guns and thick iron armor, which protected her from enemy shot and shell. Now, to really understand the Civil War along the Outer Banks, you've got to return to Hampton Roads, where in early 1862, the Confederates held most of southeastern Virginia. And this included the former Nor Norfolk Navy Yard, known as Gosport, which is still located in Portsmouth, Virginia, and is still an active US Navy Yard today. The Confederates had devised a plan to take their waterways from the Union control using the hulk of a burned out US Navy steamer by the name of Merrimack. 
utilizing iron from the Tredegar Iron Works in Richmond, Virginia, and a lot of improvisation and ingenuity. What they created was an ironclad fire-breathing monster known as the CSS Virginia, more commonly referred to by her former name, Merrimack. The upper works of the wooden steamer was sheathed in slit, thick sloped iron armor and armed with 10 cannons and an iron ram on her bow. What the Confederacy lacked in numbers of vessels, they intended to make up for in brute strength and power. Throughout the war, the Confederates built ironclad vessels. They built them on the Mississippi, around the Gulf of Mexico, in Richmond, at Charleston, and even on the Albemarle Sound just up <clears throat> at Plymouth, North Carolina. On the morning of March 8, 1862, off Newport News, Virginia, the CSS Virginia rammed and sank the USS Cumberland. She then turned her guns on the USS Congress, sinking her and burning her to the waterline. The steamer USS Minnesota was run aground, and by the end of the day, over 250 US Navy sailors were dead. Two ships of the line were on the bottom of the James River. One US Navy steamer was aground and sure to be destroyed. With only two Confederate sailors killed and the CSS Virginia barely damaged, in a single day, the wooden warships of the US Navy had become completely obsolete. The Confederate ironclad seemed to be invincible. The next day, the ironclads battled for hours with both ships maneuvering and firing into each other repeatedly. This is the US monitor as she, USS monitor as she entered the, from the Chesapeake Bay and started fighting with the Merrimack. Uh, tactically, the battle was a draw. Neither ship was able to significantly damage the other, but strategically, it was a Union victory. The monitor saved the USS Minnesota and checked the power of the Confederates, preventing them from taking control of Hampton Roads and the James River. In the days after the battle, the Confederate ironclad did come back out from Hampton Roads, but they never engaged in battle again. Uh, the CSS Virginia was scuttled by her own crew in order to avoid being captured after the Union took Norfolk, Virginia. During the early stages of the Peninsula Campaign, uh, in May of 1862, the USS Monitor advanced up the James along with the USS Galena to, in an attempt to attack Richmond. The vessels were stopped a mere seven miles short of the city by the Confederate battery on Drury's Bluff near Fort, uh, at Fort Darling in Chesterfield, Virginia. Crew members from the CSS Virginia were actually manning some of the guns on Drury's Bluff and did great damage to the Galena. The Monitor was basically unharmed, uh, but basically, they couldn't get any further closer to Richmond because the Confederates had sunk obstructions off Drury's Bluff and they couldn't make it through those obstructions under the gunfire. But that's only seven miles from Richmond, so you can see that the Union Navy pretty much at that point had free reign of the James River. Uh, this later contributed to the fall of Richmond where, because uh, General Grant was able to wage his Petersburg campaign from bases he secured on the James River near Hopewell, Virginia. Uh, at the end of 1862, with the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries mostly under Union control, the U.S. Navy brass began working on an earnest at closing the other ports of the Confederacy, especially those at Charleston, South Carolina, and Wilmington, North Carolina. The ironclads USS Monitor and USS Passaic were ordered to Beaufort, uh, North Carolina. The plan was to use them to help shut down Confederate ports. The convoy left on January 29th, 1862. Now, monitors were not really seaworthy vessels. They needed assistance on the open ocean unless it was relatively calm. The monitor was being towed by the USS Rhode Island in coordination with the USS State of Georgia and the USS Passaic. There were, it was a convoy. The uh, weather got rough. The seas were coming from the southwest off Hatteras Island, 
the Passaic started taking on water. So the Passaic in the state of Georgia turned around and returned as far up as Nags Head. The Monitor in the Rhode Island continued to, towards Beaufort. And on December 31st of 1862, the very last day of the year, the ironclad Monitor started taking on more water than the pumps could handle. And by the end of the night, she was no more. She went down uh, about 16 miles off Hatteras on the last day of 1862. The Monitor disappeared beneath the waves and 16 crewmen went down with her. And she lies there to this day. Uh, diving the USS Monitor is an adventure that not many divers get to experience. The wreck is the center of a one mile circle uh, known as the Monitor Marine Sanctuary. Diving's now permitted on the Monitor. Uh, you've got to get a permit from NOAA. These are fairly easy to obtain these days. That was not always the case, but I will let other people tell that story. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to do three dives on the Monitor. Uh, the depth is around 230 to 240 feet, which makes it a very deep dive. Uh, it's what they call a technical dive, which we use mixed gas and decompression techniques to do. We're also not allowed to anchor into the monitor, so we do what's called a hot drop dive on these wrecks. We drop into the current, land on the wreck, hopefully, and do our dive, then send up a, what we call a SMB. It's a buoy that we fill with air and send up. That way the dive boat knows where we are, and then we drift off into the current and do our decompression. On these dives, usually we do somewhere around 20, 25 minutes on the bottom, and an hour to an hour and a half of decompression. Um, here you see rebreather diver Sean Harper lighting up the ribs of the hull. The monitor lies upside down. And these are actually, this is actually the bottom of the ship, what remains of it that you see here. Uh, this is the armor belt on the monitor. When, when you're doing a, a shipwreck dive, you don't usually see this because this is eight inch thick armor with about a two inch frame behind it. And it surrounds the entire length of the wreck except for where they had removed the turret. And divers Mike Barnett and Joe Satelli are here lighting up the armor belt over the starboard side of the wreck. Uh, these deeper wrecks can be very dark and even on a sunny day, so accessory lighting becomes important. Uh, here's the remains of the oval shaped bulkhead under the turret. Uh, you can clearly see the hatchways over here on these blueprints of the monitor. And this is the, the hatchway right here. You can even see the angled slope of the hull there in the picture. Uh, while the engine has been removed from the monitor, the coal-fired boilers still remain. You can see the shape of the fireboxes in this picture right here. And remember, they're upside down. And on these blueprints here, you can see the fireboxes of the boilers. Uh, Despite innovative forced air ventilation, the insides of the monitor on a, on a warm day got brutally hot. Temperatures higher than 130 degrees made summertime operations on the James River challenging. The spot this picture was taken in uh, would have been hellishly hot in the summer of 1862. Uh, here's another image of one of the boilers. Right here, I believe what this is is the forced air ventilation monitor actually had a, a, a belt driven fan that forced warm uh, forced cold air into the boilers which was an innovative thing at that time in shipwreck design uh, this is the distinctive pointed bow of the USS monitor uh, it's still one of the most prominent features on the site if you look to the right you can see a piece of debris and this trench the, the high currents in the area have caused around the, the shipwreck. Uh, when we dive these wrecks, sometimes you have currents as high as two to three knots, which you're basically just kind of hovering over the wreck 
and trying to remain still. And it, it creates a lot of challenges. Uh, the good part about it is with the reason we have those high currents is the Gulf Stream current pushing through, which can make the visibility there is sometimes unlimited, just warm blue water, the same blue water you see in the Caribbean, only it's a few days later coming up here. Uh, uh, these are dead lights you see here. That's how light got into the ship. And they were originally on the top, top of the ship. Now the ship's upside down. And over here on the right is the remains of one of the dead lights. And uh, you see these sorts of things on these shipwrecks. And they're all covered in barnacles and growth. And it's hard to tell what they are. But if you look really closely here, you can see there's glass still inside that dead light. Uh, Mike Barnett pointed that out to me when we were diving on it. Uh, the other half of the USS Monitor is located at the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, Virginia. Uh, many items removed from the wreck are now on display. On the left you see the uh, Monitor's Ericsson designed propeller. At the center you see the Monitor's distinctive anchor. And on the right you see mustard bottles that still litter the wreck. Last summer as we were pulling up on the wreck in the current on the bottom, I, I, I swam right by one of these mustard bottles. Um, you're not allowed to take anything off the monitor. It's protected. So I just left it right where it was sitting. Uh, the cannons, turret, and steam engine of the monitor are currently being conserved and are visible from windows in the conservation center at the museum. And you can see these giant tanks that they have the whole turret in. So these are the tanks here where the cannons are in. Uh, archaeologists working inside the turret. If you're a diver with the skills and you're interested in the monitor, I highly recommend a trip to both the wreck and the museum because you can see one half of it on the wreck. You can see one half of it in the museum. Uh, the battle behind, between the ironclads is what many people think of when they picture a Civil War naval engagement, but the real meat and potatoes of naval operations was the blockade of the southern states' ports. The Confederacy was mainly an agricultural economy. Uh, they didn't have a lot of industry, and while attempts were made to expand it, uh, most of what they needed to fight the war had to be imported, and it mostly came from England. Uh, during this 20th century, we think of England as being our allies, but at the time, it wasn't too much time passed between the War of 1812 and the Civil War. The British were supplying the Confederacy. Uh, the British sold the Confederacy munitions, supplies, and a lot of luxury goods, believe it or not. Uh, most of these materials were first shipped from England to Bermuda, the Bahamas, or Nova Scotia. These were all British territories, so that part of the trip was legal. But from there, they were loaded onto what were called blockade runners and run into and out of the southern ports. Uh, to stop this importation of weaponry and goods into the south, the United States and implemented what General Winfield Scott called the Anaconda Plan, where the ports of the South would be blockaded, and then the Union Army and Union Navy would strangle the Confederacy. Uh, so you've got goods going into the South, and you've got an, a, a, a Navy trying to stop this from happening. Uh, from the outset of the conflict, Vessels were stationed off the Confederate ports with orders to stop all traffic in or out. Correspondingly, prices of goods rose. Uh, this created an economic situation where uh, a, an incentive arose for those who dared to sneak by the U.S. Navy. Uh, you can make five bucks on the dollar bringing goods into and out of the South. Uh, Goods that can be purchased from the British could be sold for many times what was paid for them in the British ports. Uh, so once into the southern ports, 
The, the vessels were loaded with cotton and turpentine, which were also extremely valuable in England. So money was made coming and going, running the blockade. So this sort of created an incentive for people to start running the blockade. Uh, at the beginning of the conflict, the U.S. Navy was drastically short of men and ships. This meant that life was good for the blockade runners. Uh, during the early days of the war, the blockade runners went into and out of the ports with relative ease. Uh, the U.S. Navy didn't have many vessels on the blockade, and it was difficult to stop the runners. The blockade ships had to keep up steam at all times and constantly be on watch, ready to go after a blockade runner day or night. And it was often during the night that the runners tried to get in. Uh, it was hot in the summer, cold in the winter. Many of the southern ports had more than one entrance, which made it even easier for the blockade runners to get into. Um, so the U.S. Navy started buying huge numbers of steamships and converting them into war steamers. The Navy began enlisting and training sailors for its new vessels. As the new ships of the U.S. Navy began arriving on the blockade, blockade running started to become more difficult, which made prices rise even higher going into and out of the South. Uh, the Navy provided an incentive for the men on the blockade ships in that if a blockade runner was captured, it was taken north and sold. Half the money was divided between the U.S. Navy pension fund and half the money was divided between the actual crewmen on the ships. So you could make almost a year's pay with the capture of one blockade runner if you were on one of the U.S. Navy ships. So you can see there was a big economic incentive on both sides of the blockade war. Uh, when Fort Fisher fell in January of 1865, the southern states were closed to commerce. At that point, without further access to British goods, it was only a matter of time. And with the Union breakthrough at Petersburg and the fall of Richmond in the start of 1865, it was only a matter of weeks before General Robert E. Lee surrendered the, the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, while the battles on land or what most cons people consider the defining actions of the Civil War. I think they could just as well be said that the war was lost at sea and the blockade brought the Confederacy down. Uh, an army can't last long without food and ammunition. Uh, Winfield Scott's Anaconda plan was pretty effective in the end, but it took a long time to work. Uh, there are quite a few vessels which were involved in the blockade war uh, which came to grief along the shores of the Outer Banks. The next four vessels we are going to look at I think of as the class of 1866. After the war ended, the U.S. Navy sold off its fleet of blockade ships and the vessels ended up on the market. Almost like clockwork, these ships began wrecking along the coast. These four ships whether they were blockade runners or blockade ships, ran aground in 1866. Uh, the S.S. Andrew Johnson served during the Civil War as the USS State of Georgia. The vessel was built in 1851 as the SS State of Georgia by Vaughn and Lynn in Kensington, Philadelphia. The State of Georgia was a passenger freighter which operated was operated by the Philadelphia and Savannah Steamship Company, making regular trips between Philly and Savannah. Uh, the state of Georgia was bought by the U.S. Navy at the end of September in 1861. Uh, she was fitted out as a war steamer and almost immediately went into service on the blockade under command of Lieutenant Commander James F. Armstrong. State of Georgia captured numerous blockade runners and towed the ironclad Passaic alongside the USS Monitor on the trip which the Monitor was lost. After the Civil War, the state of Georgia was decommissioned and sold. She was renamed the SS Andrew Johnson and the vessel wrecked on Currituck Beach on October 5th of 1866. The wrecks located behind Longfellow Cove uh, in Pine Island up in Kerala. Here's a picture from the 70s showing the wreck when in most of its side lever steam engine still stuck out of the water. The Andrew Johnson is a beach dive. It sits in 10 feet of water, kind of an interesting contrast with 
something like the monitor, which sits in 240 feet of water. But both kinds of diving have their challenges. Uh, here you can see the layout of a side lever engine. Uh, on the right is the steam cylinder, and on the left is what turned the paddle wheels. Uh, until 2014, the paddle wheel crankshaft still stuck out of the water, but she's since fallen over. Uh, this is what was visible when I dived it. Uh, this is the paddle wheel shaft, and the remains of the engine are over on the right. Sorry, the picture's not so good. Uh, this is the end of the crankshaft. You can still see the copper bushing uh, gleaming in the sun. And this is underwater from that. Uh, the paddle wheel shaft ran straight down into the sand. Uh, sheep's heads hanging out inside the remains of the steam cylinder. We took measurements on this steam cylinder and it matched what was in the Lloyd's registries for the state of Georgia. Uh, a crab makes its home in the piston rod guide. Uh, so you've got this wreck lying off the beach and hardly anybody knew, knew what it was. But its history goes back and it was involved in some pretty crazy stuff during the Civil War. Uh, State of Georgia is a prime example of a US Navy blockade ship. Uh, the next shipwreck we'll look at is an example of a ship which was used on both sides of the Civil War. And this is the SS Sheridan. Uh, the wreck of the Sheridan lies off what is today known as Pea Island. Uh, the Sheridan began her life as the Stettin. She was a fairly small British steamer. She was not terribly fast. Maximum speed was about seven knots. She was captured by the USS Bienville, uh, attempting to run the blockade off of Charleston, South Carolina in 1862. She was seized as a prize of war and sold to the USS, U.S. Navy. USS Stettin spent most of the Civil War as a blockade ship off the coast of South Carolina and Georgia. Uh, in this image, we see the Stettin, which is over here, capturing the blockade runner Ares off Bulls Bay, South Carolina in 1863. The ship appears to be schooner rigged in this picture, and the vessel is shown in very little detail. At the end of January 1863, off Charleston, the Stettin bore witness to the power of the ironclads. The Confederate ironclad rams CSS Chickara and the CSS Palmetto State steamed out of Charleston Harbor and quickly fired on and captured the USS Mercedita and the USS Keystone State. The Stettin, along with the USS Flag, steamed towards the conflict, but arrived too late to do anything but assist the heavily damaged blockade ships. Uh, Stettin was said to be a fairly slow vessel in the Navy records. It's probably a good thing that the Stettin didn't get into the action. Uh, the, uh, the two ships were just blown through the boilers with shot and shell. And when that happens, steam blasts out into the ship. And it was just, it was a bloodbath. And another example of wooden warships versus an ironclad. Uh, the Merce Mercedita and Keystone State were later released by the Confederates and sailed back into the Union fleet full of holds. Uh, the, Unarmored Stettin would have almost certainly fared no better. Uh, this is a drawing of the Stettin in pursuit of the blockade runner Havelock. Havelock was run aground and burned in 1863. Stettin was involved in the capture of numerous blockade runners during the Civil War. Uh, note in this image, she's shown with a brig rig. Uh, after the war, the Stettin was sold to William F. Well Company of Boston. She ran aground on September 24, 1866. According to the newspaper articles, she was carrying close to a million dollars worth of cargo. I think Sheridan looked about like this at the time she ran aground. Her initial Lloyd's registry stated that she was brig rigged. In her sole appearance in the American Lloyd's registry, she was reported to be schooner rigged. The crew and passengers all made it to shore safely after the stranding. What happened next is that she was boarded and salvaged by the wreckers of the Outer Banks. The plunder of her cargo was made famous in the New York Times 
where the Outer Banks wreckers were even called land pirates. The only case I've ever seen a federal prosecution of wreckers, a large number of Outer Banks residents were arrested. Uh, most of them got off with a slap on the wrist, but over $100,000 worth of cargo was seized by the federal government from residences in Roanoke Island, North Carolina. The wreck of the Sheridan lies off what is now called Pea Island. It was found by Uwe Lovas, but he never dived it. Uh, with numbers that he provided me, Reese Newman and I became the first people to dive on this site. Uh, one of the suspected vessels I knew that had met their fates there was the Sheridan. I most suspected it to be the Sheridan. The location was correct, and what we found on the site pretty much confirmed this. On the right are the U.S. Navy Civil War records of the Stettin. Notice that it was powered by two inverted steam engines with a diameter of three feet. This is what we found on the site. And this is a drawing of what we found on the site. Uh, also on the site are two small cylindrical boilers which are also listed in the Navy records. The boilers are not in the proper location in front of the engines. This could intend this could indicate attempted salvage. In fact, one of the boilers is turned on its end. The smoking gun on this to me is that the two steam cylinders are not a compound engine and they are the same size. Lots of times with a compound engine you'll find small steam cylinder and a larger steam cylinder. These two are the same size. Uh, they're not recycling the steam which is what a compound engine did. Uh, this is not a terribly common steam engine to find. It's not a very efficient design. It wastes a lot of steam. Most two-cylinder screw steamer engines are compound steam engines. Remember that the Stettin was very slow. This is the engine of a slow vessel, and this is the kind of engine that the records said the steamer had. Uh, this is the right cylinder uh, with a plate over the pipes going into the steam chest and out to the condenser. And you'll notice that it's got this yellow kind of uh, coral that grows on the northern outer banks. This is the right steam cylinder, sort of hard to tell from the photo, but looking at the size of that sheep's head, uh, you can tell it's about three feet in diameter. Uh, this is a valve on the right cylinder and the boiler lying on its side but in a very strange location between the engines. This is not the correct location of where the boiler would have been, so we think this may have been, tr they tried to salvage it. The other boiler lies on its side, closer to the correct location, and has the boiler pipes going through the middle of it. Uh, it lies on its end. Uh, this object sticks out of the sand about 20 feet from the steam engine. I honestly have no idea what it is. Uh, Uwe said that there was more hull exposed when they ran the sonar over it than when we dived on it. Uh, we hope to go back to this wreck and see when it's less sanded in. Based on the location of the machinery on the site, I would say that it's most likely the British built steamer Sheridan. So this is an example of a ship that you can dive on the Outer Banks that served both Confederate interests and Union interests. Uh, now the next ship we're going to look at is the SS Richmond, was known as the SS Blenheim most of her life. She was a fast British iron hulled side wheel steamer. Uh, Blenheim was operated as a steam packet running between Belfast and Liverpool for 14 years in the British Isles. Uh, although built in 1848, years before the American Civil War, the Blenheim had the long sleeve lines associated with a blockade runner, as well as a powerful steeple engine. In October of 1864, Blenheim steamed from Great Britain to the Bahamas and from there began operating as a blockade runner. In late 1864, Blenheim successfully ran the blockade at Wilmington four times. This was late in the war. By this point, Wilmington was the only port left open in the south. Uh, the rest had either been captured or shut by the U.S. Navy. On the night of January 24, 1865, 
Blenheim steamed off the Atlantic and followed the signal lights that the Confederates kept on the huge battery uh, known as the Mound at Fort Fisher. These were lights to let blockade runners know if it was safe to come in or not. Uh, in the early morning hours of January 25th, she dropped anchor just inside of the new inlet. And this is the spot where the new inlet used to be at Fort Fisher. Uh, at dawn the next morning in this spot, the sunlight revealed to the captain and the crew of the Blenheim a most unwelcome sight. They were surrounded by warships of the U.S. Navy. Ten days before, on January 15th of 1865, Fort Fisher had fallen to Union forces. The Federal occupiers kept the lighted signals that the Confederates used a light in hopes of luring in and capturing a, capturing a blockade runner. Their trick worked and a boarding party from the USS Tristan Shandy rode to the Blenheim and captured her in the name of the US Navy. Blenheim was the last blockade runner to be captured during the Civil War. The vessel was condemned and sold by the prize court in New York. Blenheim was bought by the steamship magnate Jacob Brandt of Baltimore, Maryland. The vessel was renamed SS Richmond and chartered briefly by the U.S. government. The Richmond was then put, on the, put to work on the Baltimore and Savannah steamship line. The vessel was headed from Savannah to Baltimore when it ran aground off Hatteras Island in January of 1866. There was no loss of life on the Richmond. However, a schooner belonging to Baker Salvage of Norfolk, Virginia was wrecked while salvaging the Richmond with the loss of all nine men on board. It has been thought that the wreck at the end of Sand Street in Salvo, North Carolina was that of the Pocahontas, but historical records place that wreck further south. And the wreck, the reported location of the Richmond is about in the right place, they said 20 miles north of Hatteras. Uh, this is fairly close to where she sits. Uh, but the smoking gun, as far as I'm concerned, is the remains of the steam engine itself. This triangular crosshead of the engine at Sand Street is the signature piece of a British steeple engine. Now you look here, see this sort of triangle sticking out of the water? And look at the apparatus at the top. Look in the center of this drawing of a British steeple engine. This is undoubtedly a steeple engine. Um, the Richmond Blenheim was, to the best of my knowledge, the only vessel to have ever wrecked on the Outer Banks that had a steeple engine. So this wreck is almost certainly the Richmond. Uh, here you can see the paddle wheel in the middle of the triangle crosshead. Uh, and the paddle wheel shaft goes down into the water. The hub of the paddle wheel is over towards the ocean side. Uh, you can also see here some of the clear water that sometimes comes in off the outer banks during the uh, summer months. Uh, now the steamer Nassau was a Canadian built Great Lakes steamer. Uh, she was first named the SS Boston and was taken to Bermuda and converted into a blockade runner there. She was shortly captured and then sold. Uh, she wrecked in 1866 in Currituck, North Carolina at Currituck Beach. She's missing. She's never been found. So this is an example of a ship that's yet to be located. And she is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of the Corallan area. Stuff that's sometimes under the sand that occasionally becomes uncovered. I'm hoping one day maybe we can find her. Uh, the last ship we're going to talk about is the Metropolis. She was built as the SS Stars and Stripes in 1861 in Mystic, Connecticut. The vessel was almost immediately chartered by the U.S. government. Um, she spent her early years off Hatteras on the blockade. Then she was used to lead Burnside's fleet up towards Roanoke Island. She fought all through the Civil War on the blockade 
ended up in the Gulf of Mexico at the end of the Civil War, where she captured a number of blockade runners there, too. Uh, the Stars and Stripes uh, captured the blockade's runner Florida, SS Laurel, and the blockade runner Caroline Gertrude. Uh, she also destroyed a number of salt works off the Florida coast during the Civil War. Uh, at the end of the war, the Stars and Stripes was sold at auction. Uh, she began running a regular route between New York and Havana, Cuba. After being sold a few times, she was bought by Lunt Brothers in 1871. The vessel was renamed Metropolis. At this time, the ship was lengthened and her engine was modified. There are later allegations that when the vessel was lengthened, rotten parts of her hull were not addressed. Uh, whether or not that's the case, there were court cases over it. It was investigated. It was never determined whether or not she was actually rotten. But she, in fact, did fail structurally at sea. Uh, on a trip from Philadelphia to Bra Brazil in late 1878, Metropolis was carrying railroad materials. Uh, she began taking on water off the Virginia coast, and they ran her aground in order to try to save her from sinking at sea. Uh, the ship was torn apart and rapidly broke up in the surf. Of her crew of 250-something crew and passengers, she lost something, I think 85 people were killed. Uh, she ground to a halt 100 yards off the breakers at Curatuck Beach. Uh, the life-saving service attempted to rescue the crew and passengers, but 60 mile an hour winds made this very difficult. Uh, a number of shots were fired from the Lyle gun to the wreck, but they broke when they were trying to pull it, and basically the passengers just had to jump off and swim for it. Uh, this is, by the next day, much of the vessel had broken up and it was said that it could be seen in the water. All you could see were the boilers and engine. In the illustration at the left, you can see lots of wooden wreckage on the beach. Uh, at right, you see what is known by the archeology span branch as the O'Keefe site in Kerala. It's behind Albacore Street Beach Access, a few blocks east of the present day food line in Kerala. The O'Keefe site has been suspected by some to be the remains of the metropolis. The location is correct, but trying to identify a single wooden shipwreck hull is rather difficult because there's hundreds of wooden vessels lost off the outer banks. I've been told, been told by people in the archaeology department uh, that they don't believe these are the remains of the metropolis. Uh, there's another large piece of wood near the spot that is sometimes uncovered. Uh, the location of the machinery of the metropolis is pretty well established, though. Uh, located in line with the end of Orion's Way in Buck Island neighborhood of Kerala, about 300 yards out, is shipwreck machinery that is well known to divers from the 1980s. Unfortunately, for many years, it's been covered up with sand. Uh, during conversations with Jim Bunch, Dave Summers, Bill McDermott, and Uwe Lovas, I've been told that during the 1980s and 1990s, the top of the machinery came to within a few feet of the surface, and that it was the remains of a steam engine and boilers. I found records in the North Carolina Underwater Archaeology Branch at Fort Fisher of work done by Richard Lawrence and a team which located the sand-covered remains with a magnetometer. I've heard they found pieces of machinery later on the site. Uh, I've yet to successfully locate the remains of the metropolis, but intend to try again in the future. So of all the Civil War wrecks on the Outer Banks, I find the wreck of the USS Stars and Stripes, known when it wrecked as the metropolis, to be probably the most intriguing. 16 years after she led the Burnside expedition to Roanoke Island, she returned to the Outer Banks to stay and lies there to this day.
Uh, the Civil War shipwrecks on the Outer Banks are very much a microcosm of the shipwrecks on the Outer Banks. There are quite a few of them that are well known and others that are less well known and others that have yet to be found. In the future, I hope to find uh, more of these wrecks. I hope that more of them are found and some more of these puzzle pieces can be put together. So uh, that's about what I have on the Outer Banks Civil War shipwrecks. Uh, if anybody would like to ask some questions, I'll be happy to answer them.